You're listening to The Corbett Report. CorbettReport.com Welcome, my friends. Welcome to another edition of The Corbett Report. I am your host, James Corbett, podcasting to you, as always, from the sunny climes of Western Japan on this 8th day of May, 2011. I'd like to welcome everyone back to the podcast and invite you all, as always, to check into my website, CorbettReport.com, where you can find previous episodes of this podcast, as well as articles, interviews, and videos created and conducted by myself in the past, and links to other websites that I've created and other valuable independent alternative media websites. On a programming note this week, I'd like to let listeners know that a rather quotidian everyday type occurrence, i.e. my wife getting a new work schedule, necessitates me moving this podcast from Sunday delivery to Saturdays. So from now on, I plan on releasing new episodes of this podcast each Saturday instead of Sunday. And Sunday update, well, at this point, I think I will continue to put it out on Sundays. So continue to look for that on my YouTube channel and, of course, at sundayupdate.blib.tv and on corbettreport.com Sundays as per usual. But the podcast will hopefully be coming out on Saturdays now instead of Sundays. So please look forward to that in the future. And finally, I would like to once again give a heartfelt thank you to all of the people who have uh, signed up to become subscribers of The Corbett Report, i.e. make a small 100 Japanese yen per month donation to help keep this independent, alternative, listener-supported media on the air. Without your support, none of this would be possible, so thank you very much, and thank you to everyone who put in their orders for the 2009 Video Archive DVD this week. Again, that support is greatly appreciated. I also received some emails this week from people who wanted to sign up to become subscribers, i.e. give a small monthly donation to The Corbett Report, but were being directed to a Japanese PayPal page that they could not read. And I have been tinkering around with the settings, and I believe I have now corrected that so that you should be getting an English language PayPal page when you hit on the subscribe button on the subscribe tab of CorbettReport.com. So hopefully that has been corrected, and anyone who was uh, deterred from signing up to become a subscriber because they did not understand the Japanese, please try again. And uh, please don't hesitate to let me know if you have any problems signing up or would like to give any other types of feedback or info. Please uh, contact me through the contact form on CorbettReport.com. Again, I read everything that comes in, and I try to respond when, as, and if appropriate. And now, without further ado, let's get straight into today's episode. If you go back 500 years, not much happened in a century. Now a lot happens in six months. Technology feeds on itself and it gets faster and faster. It's going to continue, and in about 40 years, it's going to be moving so fast, the pace of change is going to be so astonishingly quick that you won't be able to follow it unless you enhance your own intelligence by merging with the intelligent technology we're creating. This guy is freaky. He says computers will have consciousness in just 25 years. If you get to the 2030s, you're not going to be able to tell a clear difference between human and machine intelligence. He's an award-winning scientist and engineer, a millionaire several times over because of his inventions. These inventions may end up causing the worst war that humanity's ever had. Corporations and governments and societies will be created and destroyed on the back of the technology that this book describes. Inventor Ray Kurzweil thinks that one day humans may be able to live forever. I want to live as long as I can. I don't want to die. If following Ray's regimen would put that day off, I would be very willing to do that. I knew there was a reason I was keeping all this stuff, and he kept all this stuff. Uh, I do plan to bring back my father. Uh, it's going to scare a lot of people. The world is changing far too fast. Nothing like this has ever happened to Homo sapiens before. These ideas are going to ultimately change the world. We didn't stay on the ground, we didn't stay on the planet, and we didn't stay with the limitations of our biology. I think Ray is performing the service of a prophet. That's wrong. He has used the, the gift that he was given for the betterment of humankind. That's what I mean. There will be the universe waking up. 
Welcome to episode 185 of the Corbett Report podcast, The Singularity Cometh. What you have just listened to is the trailer for a documentary that I believe was created in 2009, but which has only enjoyed wide-scale release this year for some reason. I'm not really sure of the ins and outs of the production and release of this documentary, but it has recently come out and has been enjoying some media uh, attention of late. And it's called Transcendent Man, and it features Ray Kurzweil, the rather infamous, famous futurist who has been on record for some time now predicting a future time which he has referred to as the singularity. And the singularity borrows its analogy from physics, in which, of course, the singularity is a point of space-time that is infinitely dense and uh, is gives rise to things like black holes. Well, the singularity in terms of this uh, imagined future event is the point in time when artificial intelligence and machine life starts to become stronger than and outstrip human life, i.e. the machines that we have created begin to take on a life of their own. And Ray Kurzweil is well known for this idea, which he has been propounding for some time now, not only in books like The Age of Spiritual Machines and The Singularity is Near, but in many documentaries and interviews and lectures that he has delivered over the years besides. So I would like to get a little bit more into this idea of the singularity, based as it is on Kurzweil's idea of the law of accelerating returns, Basically, an idea that he has fleshed out that information technology is an exponentially accelerating growth curve, is on an exponentially accelerating growth curve, and that technology, uh, information technology, is basically following the kind of logarithmic scale that we all know in terms of Moore's Law, the idea that the number of transistors that can be placed on an integrated circuit doubles about every two years. Well, that is a well-known uh, exponential growth curve, but uh, Ray Kurzweil has spent a lot of his career fleshing out this uh, growth curve, not only in terms of the number of transistors, but in many other areas of information technology. And this is something that he goes over time and again in his lectures and I've uh, listened to a fair few of those lectures that he's delivered over the past few years in preparation for today's episode, and I can assure you that they are all very, very similar, if not identical, with even the same jokes inserted at the same places. So uh, I feel fairly confident that pretty much dipping into any of Kurzweil's lectures over the past few years will give you a good overview of this idea of the law of accelerating returns. But uh, let's flesh it out specifically with this clip from a lecture that he delivered at the University of Arizona in 2008. I have been uh, looking forward to this. Uh, the edges of life is actually something I've been thinking about for several decades, where humanity comes from and where we're going. And I actually got into this in a somewhat indirect fashion. I uh, decided I would be an inventor when I was five years old and always had a conceit when other kids were wondering what they would be that I knew what I was going to be. But I quickly caught on that key to being successful as an inventor was timing. And that most inventors fail not because they can't get their gadgets to work, but because the timing is wrong. Not all the enabling factors are in place when they need to be. So realizing this, I became an ardent student of technology trends. This was over 30 years ago. And being an engineer, I gathered a lot of data and I build mathematical models of how technology evolves. And much to my surprise, I saw that certain aspects of technology was actually very predictable. The common wisdom is, oh, you can't predict the future. And that's true for specific projects or specific companies. Will Google stock be higher or lower than it is today, three years from now? That's hard to predict. And will the next wireless standard be? WiMAX, CDMA, G3, G4, that's hard to predict. But if you ask me what will the cost of a MIPS of computing be in 2010, or what will the cost uh, of sequencing a base pair of DNA be in 2012, or what will the spatial resolution be of brain scanning uh, in vivo in 2014, I can give you a figure, and it's likely to be correct because these information properties of technology turn out to be remarkably predictable. And I'm going to show you a few dozen examples of this. We actually have hundreds of them. Uh, in the case of computation, very smooth, as Tom mentioned, exponential progression for over a century and, and highly predictable. And I say this now not just looking backwards and overfitting to past data, but I've been making these forward-looking predictions for several decades. I saw the DARPA net 
doubling each year in the 1980s, but it wasn't on anybody's radar map. It was only used by a few thousand scientists. It went from 10,000 nodes to 20,000 nodes in one year, and then to 40,000 nodes. For various reasons, I felt that doubling would continue. Doubling every year means multiplying by 1,000 in 10 years. So this would be 20 million going to 40 million, to 80 million, 160 million in the mid-1990s. And I predicted a World Wide Web connecting ultimately hundreds of millions of people. And that seemed fairly ridiculous in the mid-1980s, but it happened right on schedule in the mid-1990s. I saw the chess supercomputers doubling in power every year. Uh, that put the crossover point uh, by my calculations in 1998 uh, for a computer to, pass the, to surpass the best human. And that seemed absurd in the 1980s when an average chess player could beat the best chess machines. And Kasparov was asked about this in 93, and he said, that's ridiculous. I've played the best chess machines in the world, and they're pathetic. And that was reasonable perspective in 93, but they did sort of pass him in 97. And it t you might wonder, how can it be that we can make accurate predictions uh, when each specific project is unpredictable? And we see other examples in science those of you who have studied thermodynamics, which actually comes from the 19th century, know that we model each particle, each, uh, uh, each molecule in a gas, as following a random walk. So you can't tell where this molecule will be 10 seconds from now. But we can predict the overall properties of the gas to a very high level of precision for a very lo long period of time, uh, according to the laws of thermodynamics. So if you have a large, dynamic, chaotic, random system where each element is unpredictable, the overall properties of that system have certain predictable characteristics which you can predict. And it turns out that information, information technology is just such a chaotic, random system. Each computer project, each communications project is unpredictable, but the overall course of the number of bits we move around, the size of the Internet, the amount of data we're collecting on the brain, the amount of genetic data, I mean, there are hundreds of examples of these, follow these re remarkably smooth exponential progressions. And not only can we predict it, but as Tom mentioned, what we can predict is that they progress exponentially. And people actually don't think this way. We think linearly. Uh, this is actually hardwired. If we walked through the savannah a thousand years ago, if we saw something coming at us, we made a linear projection where it would be 20 seconds from now, and that served our needs very well. But that doesn't serve our needs well now uh, in terms of really anticipating where technology will be. But most people's intuition is in fact linear and not exponential. Because of this exponential progression of information technology, we're doubling the rate of, of technical progress every decade, what I call the paradigm shift rate. So we'll see 32 times more progress in the next 50 years than we did in the last 50 years. But, I mean, to give you an example, I gave a presentation at a conference called The Future of Life on the 50th anniversary of the discovery of the structure of DNA that Time Magazine organized. And all of the speakers there were asked to, to comment on what will the next 50 years bring. All of the th speakers there, except for one other guy, Bill Joy and myself, used the last 50 years as a model for the next 50 years. So Watson himself, the co-discoverer of DNA, said, oh, in 50 years we'll have drugs that enable you to eat as much as you want and remain slim. And I said, Jim, we've already done that in animal models uh, by blocking the fat insulin receptor gene. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. Uh, we'll have that within 10 years, not 50 years. All the projections for long periods of time, like 50 years, were radically over-conservative by failing to take this exponential progression into account. That spiel is then inevitably followed up by a demonstration of one of the remarkable inventions of Ray Kurzweil, who uses his law of accelerating returns to predict the exact timing that certain types of technologies will come on the market and be widely available, so he can get ahead of the curve and design the software in order to take advantage of that new technology ahead of time. So let's turn to a Killer App Expo conference in Fort Wayne, Fort Wayne Indiana in May of 2007, for an example of that, where he demonstrates a c camera that can help blind people to read. So four years ago, actually five years ago now, 2002, I had a conversation with Dr. Mark Maurer, the president of the National Federation of the Blind, and I'd worked with that organization on the first reading machine, and he said, Ray, you've been talking about this pocket-sized reading machine for years. When is this going to be possible? And I said, well, according to our models of electronic technology, digital cameras, and, po and pocket computers, the requisite hardware to support this application will be available 
in four years, 2006, second quarter to be exact. And he said, okay, how long will it take to develop the software? And I said, well, we can't just take OCR and speech synthesis and compress them into the PDA. We have to add a new layer of software because there's a blind person holding this device. There's three different degrees of freedom of rotation and tilt. Images will be curved. There'll be uneven illumination from the real world. You don't have to control illumination of a scanner. Poor quality optics, distorted images. I, I listed seven or eight vagaries of real world print taken by a handheld uh, camera. He said, okay, I understand. How long will it take? I said, four years. He said, okay, let's get started. So we got started in 2002, and right on schedule, this spring of, of 2006, the requisite digital cameras and PDA technology became available. A little bit to my surprise, we actually got the software project done on time. And in uh, last summer, we introduced the Kurzweil National Federation of the Blind Reader, which uh, is, is this device here. And there's now a 1,000 blind guys and gals going around reading the labels on their clothing, remainders of the bookstore, handouts at meetings like this, and really reading as they go through the day. And I'll give you a little demonstration of this. The system is in shooting mode. Camera is off. I'm ready. You can see synthetic speech has improved. Camera is on. Field of view report. Top and left edges are visible. 59% filled. Taking picture. The field of view report is actually quite comprehensive. It'll, if a blind person just pointing at a wall, it'll actually tell him or her to move Pre -processing to the Pre-processing picture. They're cutting off the left side of, the, of a poster. Or Camera is zero degrees clockwise okay, relative on, to the page. Page one, GNR 289. The AI winter is long since of and we are well into the spring of narrow AI. Most of the examples above were research projects just 10 to 15 years ago. If all the AI systems in the world suddenly stopped functioning, our economic infrastructure would grind to a halt. Your bank would cease doing business. Most transportation would be settled. Most communications would fail. This was not the case a decade ago. Of course, our AI systems are not smart and ugly yet to organize such a conspiracy, strong AI. If you understand something in only one way, then you don't really understand it at all. This is because, if something goes wrong, you get stuck with a thought that just sits in your mind with nowhere to go. Speaking cancelled. Camera is off. An unsaved doc, goodbye. And then... Once the audience has been suitably awed and overwhelmed by this display of the marvels of technology, Kurzweil begins into that part of his speech in which he introduces his listeners to the concept of human immortality, a concept that he firmly believes will become reality within our lifetimes. If we go out to 2029, it's when these trends will really become mature, We'll have a billion-fold increase in the power of information technologies, such as broadband by that time. We'll have completed the reverse engineering of the human brain. It'll be a very powerful combination to take the pattern recognition powers of human intelligence with ways in which machines are already superior. They can remember billions of things accurately. They can transmit information at electronic speeds, which are a million times faster than human language. Uh, but more, most importantly, it's not going to be an alien invasion of intelligent machines. It's going to expand our physical and mental reach. And very literally, it's going to go inside our bodies and brains and expand our, our health and our ability to do cognitive functions. Uh, nanobots, which are already, as I mentioned, is the first generation of these devices already being used in animals, will be very sophisticated uh, a quarter of a century from now. They'll be going inside our bodies, keeping us healthy from inside, augmenting our immune system. They will go inside our brains interact with their biological neurons. There are already people with computers inside their brains, not yet blood cell size, but pea size. If you have Parkinson's disease, you can have a computer put in your brain that replaces the biological neurons destroyed by that disease, and this is an FAA-approved treatment. 
and the biological neurons that used to be getting signals from these healthy neurons are now getting signals from a computer, and that works just fine. The latest generation of this FDA-approved neural implant actually allows you to download new software to the computer inside your brain from outside the patient. We have lots of devices inside the body and brain already that have two-way communication. Uh, so if it's P-size today, you apply this 100,000-fold decrease in size and billion-fold increase in capability over the next quarter century, and these will be blood cell size devices, millions of them in our brains, interacting with our biological neurons. So you want to go in virtual reality, the nanobots shut down the signals coming from your real senses, replace them with the signals that your brain would be receiving if it were in the virtual environment, and then you feel like you're in that virtual environment. And then, again, the design of these environments will be a new art form. Some will be recreation of earthly environments, like a Mediterranean beach or the Taj Mahal. Some will be fantastic imaginary environments that can't exist on Earth. You can go there by yourself or go there with other people and incorporate all of the senses. You actually don't have to be the same person. You can uh, become a different person. You go to move your arm, it moves your virtual arm. Design of virtual bodies to go with these virtual environments will be part of the same design of that environment. But most importantly, it's going to expand human intelligence, which arguably our computers already do. I mean, every time you use a search engine, you're plugging into in quite a press, impressive manner, this exponentially growing human knowledge base. We're the only species that has knowledge altogether, and we have increasingly intelligent ways of accessing it. These computers are getting closer to us. You can already search the Internet you know, with devices that fit in your pocket. These ultimately will be in our bodies and brains. It's actually a pretty convenient place to put them. And this will be an expansion, a continuation of this exponential expansion of the mental powers of our human machine civilization. And I'll leave you with one last trend before we take, have some dialogue about this. Human life expectancy has not been a constant. This is part of the process of human beings extending our reach. When our genes evolved thousands of years ago, it was not in the interest of the species for people to live, on average, past child-rearing, because then you're just using up the very precious and limited resources of the tribe. So human life expectancy was in the 20s, a thousand years ago. It was 37 in 1800, it's only 200 years ago. There was no sanitation, so there were rampant bacterial infections. There were no antibiotics. Schubert and Mozart died in their 30s, and that was typical. It was 48 in 1900. It's now pushing 80. But as we get to the mature part of this ability to reprogram biology with biotechnology, this will go into high gear. And according to my models, 15 years from now, we'll be adding more than a year every year, not just to infant life expectancy, but to your remaining life expectancy. So that's a tipping point. As you go forward a year, your remaining life expectancy will move on away from you. So if you can hang in there <laughs> for another 15 years, we'll get to experience the remarkable century ahead. Thank you very much. And how can anyone argue against that? Immortality in our grasp, the future dominated by engineered, manufactured humans who have inhabited computers and merged with machines to propagate out into space and to live forever. Well, what an enticing idea, isn't it? Or at least it should be, and yet I have no doubt that many people in the audience will be at least a little bit uncomfortable with the entire thrust of this argument and where it's heading because at some deep level we are concerned about humanity what is the nature of being a human being and to what extent will we lose that if we do start to merge with the machines as these prophets of transhumanism and the uh, the sages of the singularity would have it so let's start examining that ick factor behind this idea, and I think someone who brought it to the fore quite well in a way that does not necessarily uh, interrogate the intellectual ideas, but does bring out the idea that people are very much uncomfortable with these types of propositions. Well, let's turn to an interview that uh, Ray Kurzweil recently did to promote Transcendent Man with that arch comic and distractor puppet of the mainstream controlled corporate media who Nonetheless, once in a while does tend to get in some truth or some interesting points. Stephen Colbert of the Colbert Report. When do you say we're going to start merging with computers? 
Well, some people have. If you have Parkinson's, you can have a computer put in your body that's connected into your brain, and you can actually download new software to the computer inside your body from outside the patient, uh, deaf people with cochlear implants. There are other computerized devices we're putting in our bodies and brains. Today, it requires surgery. Uh, technology is getting smaller and smaller. This is 100,000 times smaller than the computer I used as a student, and it's also a billion times more powerful per dollar. We'll do that again in 25 years. So 25 years from now, this will be the size of a blood cell. We can introduce it non-invasively. We will have millions of little nanobots keeping us healthy from inside, augmenting our immune system. So millions of tiny nanobots through our blood system. Mm -hmm. Is there any way that couldn't turn into a horror movie? <laughs> uh, it's, not, it's actually not funny. Uh... <laughs> I don't think it is. I don't think it's funny at all. We're going to merge with this technology because they're going to be so small. I mean, I'd like to put this in my body. You know, I, I wouldn't lose it that way. You'd like to put that in your body? I would. Do you know who, you know who likes to do that too? John Kyle also enjoys it. Yeah. No. But, but isn't the idea here not putting something in us but putting us in something else? You say that we can take our personality, our knowledge, who we are, and put that in a new body, that's how we will live. Well, people a hundred years from now will think it pretty strange that we actually went through the day without backing up our mind file. I mean, you back up all the information on your computers, there's actually information in your brain, it's not a metaphor. So we will be able to capture that and restore it. You know, you could argue that people like uh, Parkinson's patients are doing a little bit of that. Why does 2045 have to significance? To cut to the chase, we will merge with our technology we're creating. We'll make ourselves a billion times smarter by 2045. That's such a profound and singular change that we borrow this metaphor from physics and call it a singularity. Because a black hole is also a singularity, correct? Right, and the metaphor is you can't see beyond the event horizon. And right, the, and because the ego of someone who lives forever is so great it collapses on itself. <laughs> Say what you will about Colbert, but I think his point about the ego being so big it collapses in on itself, I, I think that's a particularly astute observation to make, especially when you start to examine Ray Kurzweil's personal psychology and you start to see how he's very much motivated by this strange obsession he has with resurrecting his father and uh, making sure that he never dies because... Uh, I guess, well, he just wants that immortality so much. It's it's interesting, but I don't want to turn this into an ad hominem type attack on the idea of the singularity, because I think that would belittle uh, the real intellectual roots of what's going on. Because I think there is at least a possibility that what Kurzweil is talking about is actually real and is happening. And the question is, do we want this to happen? And not only from that Colbert clip, but from this clip, which is uh, from the Q&A session after that uh, lecture that we listened to earlier from 2007, we see that the audience, not only the person I'm about to play, but many of the people in the audience were, shall we say, a little bit combative or skeptical or p picking on those points of the singularity idea that seem to, to really generate that ick response, that, that fundamental uncomfortable uh, discomfort that we have with the idea that we are somehow going to necessarily merge with these machines. So let's listen to a little bit of that Q&A session and listen to, uh, well, a rather interesting response that, or at least an interesting detail that Kurzweil lets slip during his response. Uh, genetic algorithms are progressing. Uh, we use them a lot, the early genetic algorithms had fixed genomes, unlike real biological evolution where it could add genetic information, reassign the meaning of genes, have other non-coding genes that control the expression of coding genes. We've added these types of innovations and in getting actually much uh, more dramatic results. It's a good laboratory to study uh, evolution itself. It does show that you can get more intelligence out of less, but it's not a magic bullet. The proposal is not to just have some big GA create strong AI. It's one self-organizing paradigm among many uh, that we can apply to this problem. And there's many different uh, ways of looking at this. Uh, I'm on the Army Science Advisory Board, and uh, the sophistication of the autonomous systems now being developed are far more complex uh, and capable in software, not just hardware, than they were five years ago. Did you catch that? Let's listen to that again. Uh, I'm on the Army Science Advisory Board. 
Oh, that's right. So Kurzweil is working with the American military establishment. Well, that's a surprise, isn't it? Someone who's at the cutting forefront of this technology and pushing all of these transhumanist ideals just happens to also work with the uh, the U.S. military. Well, that's that's interesting, isn't it? Perhaps unsurprising to the listeners of this podcast who probably realize that this is really where this uh, this discussion is heading, because as much as there is an ick factor behind this type of talk of men merging with machines and biological beings becoming into uh, silicone-based life forms, well, as, as disgusting as that is on some level, it doesn't present too much of an intellectual argument against what's happening. No, a real argument against this process is to examine who is controlling and funding this technology, who is bringing it into existence, and who will be using it for their own ends, and puppeteering it to make sure that the real life-saving, amazing, incredible technology that is coming into our grasp does not become the property of John Q. Public, but will only be used by those with their hands on the levers of power. And that is where we begin our real analysis of this subject. Because, again, my point is not to say that we need to be Luddites and to reject technology, but we do have to be realistic about the way that technology is wielded as a tool by the same people who wield all the tools in our society and have their hands on the levers of power and on the instruments of financial control through which society can be directed. So... Is it reasonable to assume that this technology will be necessarily democratizing in its nature, as Kurzweil often goes on to talk about? Or is it reasonable to assume that this technology will only serve to enhance and even build up that oligarchy and hierarchy of control that has always existed to a certain extent in every human civilization, and which we are very much opposed to? Well, as one might well imagine, this tends to be one of those aspects of the story that is not so well scrutinized among the proponents of this transhumanist ideal of the singularity. And one place that I would recommend people to go to in order to stay up to date with singularity news, because as disgusting as it may be, or as uncomfortable as it may be for some of us, it's still important to know about what's going on. So I keep an eye personally on singularityhub.com. This is a website that tends to track news stories related to the singularity, and in amongst the regular types of headlines about new advances in various pieces of technology, you can often find extremely interesting stories that tend to go not entirely scrutinized or not scrutinized enough by the people who are promoting this kind of furthering of mankind through the merging of technology with biology. So even as I'm recording this on the 8th of May 2011 here in Japan, I could just browse through the RSS feed from Singularity Hub to find such stories as Children of Guanajuato, Mexico in Biometric D-Base, i.e. Database, or Big Brother Can Drive, Police Car Mounted Cameras Scan 10,000 License Plates Per Hour. And it's interesting that these stories tend to be framed on this site in the context of, well, it's good for law enforcement and it will help them catch more of those dastardly criminals. And to that extent, and it framed in that way, who could argue, isn't it a wonderful thing that technology will be able to enable police to capture criminals better than ever? Of course, the idea that this technology could ever be abused or ever fall into the hands of people who would use this to oppress the citizenry instead of merely enforce the laws, or, well, let's not even bring in the idea of what are the laws, who makes them, and to what, to what ends. But uh, this, this type of scrutiny is obviously not the type of scrutiny that the members of the SingularityHub.com community really want to take too close a look at. And it's not to say I'm not trying to belittle the the people who are involved in this movement. I think a lot of them probably are very earnest people who do earnestly and truly believe that there will be this wonderful revolution of technology which will lead to a type of utopian society. I'm sure those people truly do believe that, but I think they are being at the very best dangerously naive about the real possibilities of what this revolution might actually mean. So let's start scrutinizing what it might mean for military uh, uh, interests to be getting involved with this technological revolution and how this might turn into, well, technologies that maybe you and I would not want to see implemented by the governments and the militaries that we know are behind so much of the terror and hysteria that we see today. The brain was considered the last frontier, really, the impenetrable part of us. 
and we are just learning that we can actually go in there and read thoughts. For Professor Miguel Nicolelis, the key to the human mind lies in studying some of our closest relatives. By implanting electrodes into the brains of monkeys, Nicolelis is able to eavesdrop on their thoughts. We have been recording this every day for the last five years. So we have listened to this brain for the last five years. And every day we learn something new about how it is that it operates. Here you see one brain cell firing every time the animal wants to move its arm. And here you have a collection of hundreds of these cells. It's a sweeping flow of electricity across the entire brain. And I actually see the building up of the code. It's a hidden code. We don't have a Rosetta Stone. We don't know where to start. We don't know what the symbols mean. In a groundbreaking but controversial experiment, Nicolelis set out to make sense of this secret language. First, he trained a monkey to play a computer game, using a cursor to meet a moving target. As the monkey controlled the joystick, Nicolelis recorded the activity of the hundreds of brain cells involved in making these complex movements. He then translated these biological recordings into the language of a computer. This now allowed him to perform an extraordinary feat. He connected the monkey's brain to a computer that drove a robotic arm. The computer read the monkey's thoughts and made the robotic arm move in exactly the same way as the monkey's. Nicolelis was using the thoughts of another being to control a machine. He had shown that the seemingly opaque language of the brain could be read. It's all here. And this is not only in a primate brain, it's in our own brain. The day we discover how our brain works is going to be by understanding sounds like this and images like this. This is the essential alphabet of the mind. All memories, all our thinking of the future, our expectations, our love, our sorrows, is all embedded in these patterns. The fear of technology's power to transform humans is not entirely unfounded. One event in Professor Miguel Nicolelis's research has revealed just how far reaching its effect could be. Well, I like to call that the turning point moment of my life. And that moment probably will never be equal to anything we'll do in the rest of our careers because there was an instant where a completely new field opened up. Nicolelis had connected the brain of a monkey to a computer. As the monkey moved a cursor, Nicolelis used the data from its brain to move a robot arm. In doing so, he had shown how the monkey's thoughts could be read. But the monkey was about to turn the tables on Nicolelis. Rather sudden, our uh, monkey, Aurora, stopped moving her arm, and when we saw that, there was a profound silence in the room because we knew that history had been made right at that moment. The monkey realized that it didn't have to move its arm to play the game. It could now control the robotic arm by thought alone. The brain finally was freed from the body and could now act upon the world directly, directly, just by producing what it produces every second, electrical activity that could now be harnessed to generate motion. So it needn't, the brain did not need the body anymore. Nicolelis had shown how technology could enhance the capabilities of humans. But within the breakthrough, 
lies an equally dark promise. Much of the backing for brain-machine interfaces comes from a secretive arm of government just outside of Washington, D.C. For one observer, it is just another sign of the double-edged nature of technology. Well, this is the DARPA building, D-A-R-P-A, -A, an acronym for, I think it stands for Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. The philosophy is create projects that are very risky in the sense there's a small probability that they may pan out, they may actually work, but if they do work, the payoff is enormous. For DARPA, harnessing the work of brain machine scientists offers the hope of future military advantage. And they're charged to, to you know, perform research that results in new technologies that keeps America in the lead. That's, that's the whole point. Well, that clip comes from an interesting BBC documentary that goes under the title on YouTube of Technology of Mind Control Neuroscience Experiments. So I will, of course, leave you to go and explore that documentary in its full and to uh, take a look at it. It does raise some interesting points, but very interestingly, it brings up the example, of course, of the Unabomber and presents that as the idea of the type of person who might be opposed to this coming technological utopia of a total government control over everything, including potentially our minds. Well, I think a lot of people would be put ill at ease by such a concept and not necessarily people like the Unabomber who want to start some sort of campaign of terror and start exploding people in order to stop technological process. But it is interesting to see that in these types of documentaries about this problem, that is generally the idea that is held up as the way that people protest against this. It, there is never any sense that there is a rational, logical, methodical way that people can actually put their, their selves into the gears of the machinery that is producing this technology of the future. No, the only way to oppose it, or so we are told or shown in these types of documentaries, is something like the Unabomber. And of course, if we don't support him and what he did, then, well, there's no way to oppose this technology. Well, it does raise the very interesting question of if there is some sort of ideal to look up to, is there some way that we can resist the seemingly inevitable process of technology? And to some extent, it would be interesting to take a look at where this idea came from that the progress of technology is some sort of unstoppable juggernaut and that there's nothing that can be done to stop it. If human beings, beings can do it, they will do it, according to the, uh, the unspoken maxim that we all seem to, to understand intuitively. So it is interesting to think of where that idea has come from and why it's been implanted into us. But at any rate, I think it's also important to take a look at the idea of possible historical situations in which people did resist technology and whether it was fruitful or not. Trina, can you explain for us who actually were these first Luddites? Well, the first Luddites in March, April 1811 were, as you said, from Nottinghamshire, Leicestershire, Midland counties. And they attacked frames um, which made stockings. It's the main industry in, in Nottinghamshire, Leicestershire. So they were aggrieved at the fact that these new frames were producing cheap stockings which were taking away their skill, taking away their independence. So there was a big push in the spring of 1811, so I guess it's the, the 200th anniversary of it um, this year. And what did they think that smashing the machine, machines would achieve? I mean, I can quite see why it'd be an outburst of frustration and rage, but would they not have just thought that someone else would bring in some new machines fairly soon afterwards? These machines are quite costly, actually, um, especially the um, power looms that we see in Lancashire and the Northwest, which, um, you know, th take up a, a large amount of space. So these are attacks on property, they're attacks on the livelihoods of the manufacturers. Um, and what they were protesting against wasn't just the machines themselves, but the whole system that they represented, which was that these manufacturers were becoming much more enamoured by Adam Smith and free market um, economics 
and these machines represented the taking away of their independence and their skill and leaving things to the market, the, the invisible hand. So this isn't just um, opposing technology because um, they're resisting change. They're resisting a particular type of change which they see is, is taking away their skill. Well, that's certainly an interesting bit of history, and it's good to know, but is the Luddite example really an analogy that we want to pursue in our, what, neo-Luddite movement? Will smashing pieces of technology or taking the iPhone out of someone's hand in order to break it on the ground really do anything to stop the encroachment of this technological society? Well, the answer, I think, is self-evidently no, but that doesn't stop some people, I think, from arguing that we will have to reject this technology in one form or another, whether that means actually physically smashing it or simply not buying it, which would probably be a more sane and rational approach at this point. But uh, certainly we can, and I think should, argue that any and every one of the corporate entities that cooperates with the encroachment of the military sphere and the law enforcement sphere into the technology of the future, such as Apple and Microsoft and Google and, in fact, every cell phone manufacturer, as has been recently re re revealed with the wave of stories about how cell phones are designed to track you and that information is designed to be given to governments. Well, not only do we have to vote with our dollars, and completely reject that corporate structure of technological control, but I really don't think that's enough. I think we have to do something more to try to build up a bulwark against this technological control, and I'm, I'm afraid, I don't know, but I believe that perhaps the only way to do that is by engaging technology on its own terms. Well, that's a rather lofty and vague way of putting things, so let's see if we can find of a specific instance where that can be applied. And let's take a look at a very interesting article that uh, was covered on cyberspacewar.com back in November of 2010, Dead Drops When Cybercom Pulls the Net. And it reads in part, quote, Is there a dead drop in your future when Cyber Command pulls the plug on the net? Aaron Bartol suggests how to build an offline network using those old USB flash drives around the house. Dead Drops is an anonymous, offline, peer-to-peer -peer file sharing network in public space. It's 21st century ingenuity and coolness all at once. Please check out the Dead Drops video on YouTube and add your Dead Drop to the list of locations and make your PDF for the first time when the net is no longer at your fingertips. The, there are dead drops in Melbourne, Paris, Ontario, New York, and Germany, end quote. Now, that is, of course, one very, very small example of how ingenuity and resourcefulness can create a technological solution to the technological control grid, but it is nonetheless one idea. And although it's not perfect, it is still something that could be done if there was to be a mass movement of resistance to these overarching systems of control, which often control our lives. There are other ideas is, for example, how to build up a Wi-Fi network uh, that would basically be an internet, but which would only consist of Wi-Fi connections in localized areas so that people could build up a nationwide or even international, supposedly at one point, uh, network that was completely off the grid from the 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 control and architecture of the internet, which of course is the DARPA net, which of course was American military backed, funded and created from the very start, which is really the point of this, that the technology that we have around us is very much a product of the military industrial complex and is still very much serving those interests as the architecture for the back doors are built into the very hardware that we purchase with our own dollars. But as I say, that's only one very small a technological example of how people can institute a, a very localized and completely decentralized solution through technology to the problems posed by the control grid of technology. But we also have to think on much wider scales. And that's why I would very much recommend people to go out and read an article, which of course I will link to in the documentation list for today's episode, called Why the Future Doesn't Need Us by Bill Joy, who back in the early days of Wired Magazine, back in April of 2000, wrote a very detailed and very thought-provoking article that really raises many of the points against the uh, approaching singularity and really provides that counterbalance to the 
wide-eyed utopian idealism, if that's what it really is, of Kurzweil and the other proponents of the singularity. And I will not actually do that article injustice by reading only a small section for you here. I really do suggest that you go and read the entire article, even though it is extremely lengthy for the modern sensibility. I really do suggest people read it front to back to in order to get a better co- a comprehension and understanding of just how massive the problems facing us really are. And until you understand things like the Grey Goo scenario, how can you possibly understand the enormity of the changes that we're facing? But once you do that and you've read that article, I would posit to you that uh, it would be unfair to say that people like Kurzweil are completely unaware of the problems posed by this future technological society. And we can actually look to an op-ed that was co-written by Kurzweil and Bill Joy back in 2005 about another very, very worrying aspect of ways that technology in the future can be used to cause great harm. And it comes from a very disturbing op-ed from the New York Times, October 17th, 2005, called Recipe for Destruction, which reads in part, quote, After a decade of painstaking research, federal and university scientists have reconstructed the 1918 influenza virus that killed 50 million people worldwide. Like the flu virus is now raising alarm bells in Asia, the 1918 virus was a bird flu that jumped directly to humans, the scientists reported. To shed light on how the virus evolved, the United States Department of Health and Human Services published the full genome of the 1918 influenza virus on the internet in the GenBank database. This is extremely foolish. The genome is essentially the design of a weapon of mass destruction. No responsible scientist would advocate publishing precise designs for an atomic bomb, and in two ways, revealing the sequence for the flu virus is even more dangerous. First, it would be easier to create and release this highly destructive virus from the genetic data than it would be to build and detonate an atomic bomb given only its design, as you don't need rare raw materials like plutonium or enriched uranium. Synthesizing the virus from scratch would be difficult, but far from impossible. An easier approach would be to modify a conventional flu virus with the eight unique and now published genes of the 1918 killer virus. Second, release of the virus would be far worse than an atomic bomb. Analyses have shown that the detonation of an atomic bomb in an American city could kill as many as one million people. Release of a highly communicable and deadly biological virus could kill tens of millions, with some estimates in the hundreds of millions. A science staff writer, Jocelyn Kaiser, said, Both the authors and science's editors acknowledge concerns that terrorists could, in theory, use the information to reconstruct the 1918 flu virus. And yet, the journal required that the full genome sequence be made available on the GenBank database as a condition for publishing the paper. We urgently need international agreements by scientific organizations to limit such publications and an international dialogue on the best approach to preventing recipes for weapons of mass destruction from falling into the wrong hands. Part of that discussion should concern the appropriate role of governments, scientists, and their scientific societies and industry. We also need a new Manhattan project to develop specific defenses against new biological viral threats, natural or human-made. There are promising new technologies like RNA interference that could be harnessed. We need to put more stones on the defensive side of the scale. End quote. Now, I will let you go and read that uh, article for yourself, the op-ed, because once again, it's just astounding that the United States Department of Health and Human Services did publish the full genome of the deadly 1918 Spanish flu on the Internet for access by anyone at any time. And that is chilling in and of itself, especially because, as listeners to this podcast will no doubt be aware, that of course gives cover to the very government agencies that are supposed to harbor these secrets to then claim that it got out into the public and then use that uh, that excuse to release it themselves to cause whatever false flag panic they want to cause. And that's, I'm sure, the way that many of my listeners will be reading that. And uh, again, I don't really agree with Kurzweil and Joy that you can put that toothpaste back in the tube or that you can somehow g- get some sort of international system of agreements whereby we can prevent this information from falling into the wrong hands, because that uh, really supposes that the right hands are the governments of the uh, health and human services and other such departments that do have this information, whereas 
I know listeners to this podcast will know that government agencies are not to be trusted with this type of information under any circumstances. But I do stand behind the idea that there does need to be some sort of Manhattan project, well, perhaps not along those lines, but some sort of mass project for people who are working in this industry to start constructing the types of technologically introduced defenses to this type of viral warfare and other things that we will no doubt see developed in the near future. And that has to be an open and transparent process. And of course, it cannot be put in the hands of governments because they are the ones who will undoubtedly be releasing this type of biological warfare on a mass scale in the future. So is technology the answer to the coming technological enslavement? Well, that's a very, very difficult question to ponder, because I think in some ways it is, and in some ways there's no doubt that we start to become what it is that we are fighting if we take it up on its own field of battle. If we start trying to find technological solutions to the problems posed by the influx of technology, well, where does that leave us, only ever more dependent on the very technology that we are trying to struggle against? Again, I'm not here to say that people should not be excited about the marvelous, miraculous possibilities of the future of technology, but that we need to have a very, very, very serious dialogue at all layers and strata of our society about where this is heading and what it really means, and in what hands we want to place this type of information and this responsibility. That's it for this week. I am James Corbett, asking you to join me next Saturday for the next episode of The Corbett Report. I am the very model of a singularitarian. I'm combination transhuman and mortal estextropian. Aggressively, I'm changing all my body's biochemistry because my body's heritage is after genetically. Replacing all the cells these bunches here just temporarily The pattern of my brain and body's weather's continuity I'll try to improve these patterns with optimal biology But how will I do that? I need to be smarter Ah yes, I'll expand my mental faculties by merging with technology Expand his mental faculties by merging with technology Expand his mental faculties by merging with technology Expand his mental faculties by merging with technology and with our new technology, renewable clean energy, remove our pathogens and overcome hunger and poverty. In short, I am a transhuman, a modalist extropian. I am the very model of a singularitarian. The Corbett Report is brought to you by The Corbett Report 2009 Video Archive. Buy your copy today at CorbettReport.com.